Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. And very welcome to our webinar, Tax Investigations. Loads of people joining us again. Really appreciate that. Hope everyone's had a good day. We will be starting this in a couple of minutes once everybody who's registering has, has joined. We can see people registering at the moment and coming into our live webinar. We appreciate, every, appreciate everybody coming to join us this afternoon. Should we give it a few minutes and then make a start, Dave? Yes, let's give it uh, another minute or so while we let people um, come in. It was due to start at five o'clock. We're, we're almost at five. Excellent. A few more people are joining us now. We're seeing people come in their numbers. Yes. So we'll have an um, initial introduction of everybody when, when, as soon as we start, and then we will go into the presentation, which covers a number of topics that will be of, of interest to everybody and then we will end with a, a Q&A session. You can type in questions in the panel on the right hand side of the screen. If you type your question there, we will answer them at the end of this session. Hopefully we'll get through as many questions as, as we can. Obviously it depends how many people send questions in and limited by the time. This is due to end um, right, just be, before six o'clock. Um, we, we expect the presentation will last 20, 30 minutes, and then there'll be 10, 15 minutes or so of questions and answers. Shall we start um, off? We seem to have got the vast majority of people now, I think, in the, in the room and have joined us. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Good afternoon. If, if I may introduce myself initially, my name is Dave Jennings and I'm a tax director here at Churchill Tax Advisors. I'm an ex-HM Revenue and Customs Senior Inspector. I've spent some 30 odd years uh, providing tax advice, either within HMRC, investigating individuals, high net worths, businesses, multinationals and the like. And the last 14, 15 years, helping people on this side of the fence in top 10 firms and at uh, Churchill Tax Advisors. I'm, I'm an author of, of an, uh, a number of books as, as well and have represented clients through the tax tribunal system and provide expert witness reports in tax prosecution criminal cases. That, uh, that is my background and if I can introduce my colleagues uh, Phil Webb and uh, Imad Ilyas. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I joined HMRC in 1990, was with them for 17 years. I was a tax investigator uh, and dealt with uh, many fraud cases. And then for the last five years, I became a tax advocate in the solicitor's office, representing HMRC in the tax tribunals. Um, although I'm not legally qualified, I was trained by them to be an advocate and by the number of cases I had when I left, clearly I was a, working as a solicitor on the cheap. <clears throat> by, um, after leaving, I've worked for niche and boutique tax litigation firms uh, where we've done many uh, tax uh, and VAT tribunals and was involved in the uh, biggest or the longest ever tribunal for Megantic Services Limited which lasted just over seven months. 
uh, and I've been with Churchill Tax since the 1st of April uh, 2019. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Imad Elias. I'm the Head of Tax Investigations at Churchill Tax. Uh, I, I have a number of years of experience of working in tax investigations, uh, ranging from uh, complex tax fraud investigations, uh, the likes of COP9, COP8, COP all the way to compliance checks and uh, uh, voluntary disclosures. I've also uh, helped clients with uh, uh, alternative dispute resolution. That's something I'll be talking about later during the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Philip. I will now share my screen, which will have the slides on. Can you see my s s screen, Philip and Imad? No. Not yet, okay. Can you see it now? Uh, not yet. Are you doing screen share? Yes. Uh, you minimize this screen. Okay. Yes, you can see it now. Good. Now I've got the screen. Fantastic. So this is um, Chester Tax Advisors. We provide a full range of specialist tax advice to clients and other firms of accountants, lawyers, IFAs, uh, and everybody around investigations work and bespoke tax planning. Today's seminar is, covers tax investigations and how to deal with the revenue when they come knocking and what can you do. The aim of today is to cover appeals, alternative dispute resolution, internal reviews and the tribunal itself. But I will start with something that's very topical uh, and new um, in, in, that's, that's occurred this last, last week and that's an item we did cover at the previous monthly webinar and that is the the revenue uh, have now started to uh, pursue people who may have making, made um, incorrect CGRS and CI, CISS um, grant payments, furlough payments to, to staff and employees. There's a, a huge number of, of people have been reported in the press as having made complaints to HMRC's hotline saying that they've been furloughed but asked to work or being furloughed and not receiving pay. Those those sort of issues. The, the legislation um, was drafted. Uh, consultations ended on the 12th of June. That is currently going through Parliament and the 2020 Finance Bill is due to receive royal assent within the next few weeks before Parliament goes into its summer recess. That legislation, is, if it's passed as it was drafted, will provide a 30-day amnesty window from the date of royal assent or from the date of receiving future payments in which the employer or a self-employed person can disclose any errors in the grant claims they've made. Or if in the, in, the, in the worst case scenario, they admit to having made fraudulent claims. And again, our advice would be to come forward before the revenue open an investigation, or at worst, criminally prosecute for fraud. So last week, there was an arrest of an individual in, in the Midlands, a 50 odd year old um, gentleman, who is alleged to have defrauded HMRC of nearly half a million pound of furlough payments. It was linked with other uh, tax fraud, tax evasion, and some money laundering offence with eight other people. So it's just one part of a multi-million uh, raid that the revenue did in the Midlands and various um, other premises. But it's indicative of the fact that the revenue will come down hard on fraud. So we'd certainly advise if anyone has made a genuine mistake or error, check and review your grant claims. If you have uh, made a deliberate uh, mistake, then uh, the possibility is during the amnesty to come clean and avoid 
penalties, which can be up to 100% of the liability. That liability being a full clawback of 100% of the grant payments that shouldn't have been paid out by the revenue. So there is a warning there, and if you need help, please contact us and we can assist you with making disclosures to HMRC. If I now hand you uh, everybody over to, to Philip, who will cover the initial um, issues around uh, appeals against decisions made by HMRC and what the options are. Thank you, Dave. Um, basically, once the investigation has come to an end, a taxpayer has to decide what to do. Do they want to accept an assessment if one has been issued or a decision if it's uh, something about a liability or um, uh, uh, some uh, administrative matter? Do they want to accept that? And they have a choice to make. They can either accept it they can ask for a review if they ask for a review in a direct tax matter we will come on to why they have to do that anyway <clears throat> and then after that they can apply for alternative uh, dispute resolution which is uh, a, a facilitated uh, discussion uh, between the taxpayer and hmrc officers and imad will cover that in more depth and then if all else fails, um, then you can apply or you must apply to the first tier tax tribunal where you will get your case heard. Now, with the reviews, if you have a direct tax decision or assessment, you cannot go straight to appeal because if you do, the tribunal will reject the appeal. What you must do is you must ask for an independent review and you will receive a view of the matter. Now, the independent review will be carried out by a customs officer, an HMRC officer. And as you can imagine, the number of cases that are overturned on review are very small. It does happen. And sometimes the officers, the independent officers, will look at matters and say, yes, I don't believe the officer has got it right. So it is. It's a source of resolving things, and if you could get a, a, an issue resolved on that, on a review, that would be great. I think Philip has. Uh, Philip will be joining, so I'll. I'll uh, can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'll cover the alternative dispute resolution part. Now, essentially, uh, this is uh, ADR is a facility that is offered by HMRC when uh, you have been trying to resolve an inquiry with, uh, with the officer that's working on the inquiry and haven't been able to reach a resolution. Now, uh, we, we've, uh, here at Churchill Tax, we, we specialize in ADR. We've had, we've had very good results. In ADR, we've had a lot of cases that have been going on for several years, and uh, we have been able to resolve them by putting them through ADR. So let's uh, uh, let, let, let's look at uh, ADR in a bit more depth. Now, while the guidance says that you can apply for ADR at any stage of the inquiry, uh, normally we would see that it's people opt for ADR when a decision has been made and you do not agree with the decision. So now whether it's direct tax or indirect tax, the procedure would be, you would be given a decision letter and uh, you will have, uh, th there's a 30 day window, you are offered a review uh, or, uh, or then you can go for the appeal with tribunal. If you want to go for ADR, you have to apply uh, to uh, the first year tribunal, get that appeal accepted, and then apply for uh, ADR. Now, uh, the way ADR works is it it's uh, facilitated mediation. So the ADR facilitator is is someone who is trained uh, in uh, in mediation, and he will uh, he or she will 
try and bring both parties to the table. When you apply for ADR, they will obviously, uh, you will be asked as to why you think uh, ADR is suitable. Um, and uh, in, on the day of ADR, the facilitator will basically be impartial. Although they come from HMRC, they come from a completely different department and they just try and offer uh, an opportunity for both parties to see things from a different angle. Now, uh, one, one, of the, one of the other things that uh, we want to look at is ADR in the, current, uh, in the current lockdown situation. Lockdown has lifted, but HMRC are continuing to work uh, remotely. So this, this is coming from uh, one of the ADR facilitators that I was speaking to. And uh, normally we would have ADR face to face, but now what is happening is they're opting for uh, audio or a video facility. So that's just something to consider, but uh, overall it's a very good process and uh, it, it just allows you an opportunity to reach a resolution. Yes, and I know from, from my experience, and um, I was, I just left HMRC when mediation first came in, the ADR first came in, and I was involved in doing some initial presentations uh, to senior inspectors within the revenue, um, been giving my experience of mediation from the outside working for, for accountants and uh, I think when it very very first started everybody was uh, quite 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 uh, jaundiced about it and, and thought it, it wouldn't work and it's still going to be the revenues decision a bit like the internal reviews quite often it might rubber stamp what the original caseworker um, suggested in the internal review but but certainly with with ADR it isn't the facilitators are qualified mediators they have gone through a qualification period they have done training in mediation and as Imad said they are totally separate from the uh, the inspectors and I think statistics show that something in the region of 70 percent of cases are actually decided in favor of the taxpayer so it's definitely something to, to consider I know that if it's a, an extremely complex area or maybe of national importance to HMRC, then ADR might be refused and they'll, they'll say that needs to be something that can only be dealt with at, at the tribunal. Um, we the, the rules changed quite recently, as, as Imad uh, stated, and that you can you can now um, apply for, for, for ADR after statement of case and during directions of tribunals, whereas previously the, uh, the revenue would refuse ADR full stop once she went down the um, tribunal route uh, with uh, with the uh, stem to case having been produced. But it but it is very very important not to miss uh, deadlines, and you should still apply the appeal to the tribunal in parallel with going down the ADR route if there is a deadline for applying for appeal to tribunal. It's very important deadlines. Yes. Yes. Was there anything else you wanted to add on ADR, um, Imad, before we... Yes, just, we just, a, just a final point. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it, is, it is a very useful facility that HMRC have, uh, have provided. It certainly works, provided you have the skill and experience of being able to uh, uh, work through ADR. And we certainly have uh, successfully closed a number of ADRs. It's just uh, it's just about the approach that you take. And uh, it, 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 I would say before you go to tribunal, it's just something you, you can you can consider. Yes, and the tribunal rules do actually um, state um, in, in I think it's rule three does to state have you already considered ADR? Um, exactly. So the, the tribunal do expect yeah they do expect ADR to have, to have been uh, an option or at least looked at. Um, the, the, I suppose the downside of, of um, ADR is that you, the, the taxpayer, the client, does have to be willing to give something up. You know, it, it is 
it's mediation it's finding the some sort of middle ground if you're not prepared to budge at all then it's highly unlikely you're going to reach a, a solution it doesn't mean to say that following adr the revenue wouldn't close their case with no further inquiry no further liability that can certainly happen and and has happened with with churchill but you've got to go into it with the intention of at least um, negotiating and, and reaching some form of middle ground if it's possible to or it can just be a question of if a case has been going on for ages and it's reached an impasse it might be a way of resolving a couple of points when there's maybe 10 outstanding so at least it either clears the air with nature mm -hmm. and puts them on point or it, it clears up a couple of contentious issues and then concentrate on, on the rest um, also, if, if the revenue do refuse an ADR application, they then um, at least put the caseworker on notice that they need to try and close their case within a short period of time. If, again, an inquiry has been going on for, for a long time and they're not been able to reach settlement, it can, even if you don't get the ADR agreed by HMRC to go through, it's still worthwhile making that, that approach. Uh, and again, you need to take advice on that um, if you're in that situation. So I'll bring Phil, um, Philip back on again. If, uh, Philip, if you would like to talk everybody through the um, tax tribunal process, please. Yes. So if your um, reviews have been unsatisfactory, then you have 30 days to make an appeal to the first tier tribunal. Now, that will involve filling out a tax appeals form in which you will get your first chance to give the grounds for why you think HMRC are wrong. Um, and you can put down all the reasons and you then show with the form the decision that you're appealing against. Um, there are some occasions when, for a variety of reasons, people are late. And if the uh, lateness is uh, not too long and is not is for a good reason, then normally HMRC won't object, although that shouldn't be taken as read and the time limit should be tried to be followed. One thing I should say about the uh, filling the form out is that in a VAT appeal, you are required to pay the tax that you owe before you are able to uh, conduct the to carry on the appeal. For most people, that is impossible to do, bearing in mind some of the assessments that HMRC raise, and therefore you have to apply for hardship. And hardship is you're saying at this moment in time, I can't afford to pay that amount, and the. HMRC can't take some of the money. It has to be that you can afford the whole amount. And if you can't, then you are granted hardship. It is something I suspect that will be looked upon sympathetically with um, appeals that start now due to COVID with the problems people have having where businesses have been either closed um, or have been uh, working on much reduced uh, hours, the HMRC will be sympathetic. So once you've got your appeal, you may have tried ADR and ADR has not worked. You are then going on to challenge the decision that HMRC have given you. And this is your final chance to dispute HMRC's facts and, excuse me, and provide your own so that you can uh, try and convince a judge that HMRC are wrong and you are right. That is done, first of all, by the appeal form and your grounds of appeal. It will then be done via your witness statements where you will explain how something has arisen um, and you will set out with the aid of exhibits um, what happened and why HMRC are wrong. There will also be witness statements given to uh, given to the you by HMRC where they will put their case. And sometimes there does the gap between the two uh, is not as wide as in anticipated. 
but in a lot of times HMRC will take a diametrically opposed uh, position to that which is in the appellant's witness statements. Once you've done that, you then start to prepare. There may be supplemental witness statements. So if HMRC have gone first, you are then responding to them. And then if there's something they don't like or believe that we've mentioned that they can refute, they then get another go. And then you get a final go as well. Once that is over, you start to prepare for the final hearing. Before the final hearing, skeleton arguments are presented, which will set out the law and why we believe the taxpayer is right in law for what they have been doing. And HMRC will set out in this, their skeleton argument why they believe they are right in law. When you're in the tribunal, you are heard before independent judges they don't work for hmrc they work for the uh, majesty's court service there will be usually a judge and an independent lay member who will sit and will hear the evidence once the evidence is heard they will retire for several weeks it can be months if it's a complicated tribunal and a complicated hearing and then they will issue a decision. And if you don't agree with the decision, then you have the right of appeal. But you can only appeal if the judge has made an error of law that has reached a, a decision that is prejudicial to you, the taxpayer. Unless, and the only caveat I would say to that is if they have materially misunderstood the facts that were presented to them in the tribunal. That does happen, but it does happen rarely. Um, and once a decision is accepted or not, if it is accepted that, and it's a successful decision for the appellant, then the decision goes away and celebrates. If the, if the decision goes against the appellant, then usually the money that has been in uh, contention would then become available to the uh, revenue to collect um, and any penalties and interest that goes with it. I think that's all for that. So a key thing here, and it just saves so much trouble, is when you get the initial decision letter to ask for a review, you've got 30 days. If after the review is finished, you're still not happy, you've then got 30 days to appeal. And if you get a, a, a VAT decision or notice of assessment, you have 30 days, regardless of whether you're going to do ADR or not. What you do is you make your application and then you ask for a stay for a, or you can ask for a stay or, as uh, Imad has pointed out, you can say, right, well, I want to see what they're saying in their statement of case before I make an ADR application. Or I want to see what their witness statements say before I make an ADR application. And now HMRC, despite in the past trying to say that you could only have ADR with an appeal in, now it is much more flexible um, and is designed to, I think, cure a tribunal backlog and to try and save taxpayers money. So let me just uh, add in on this part, especially, especially about the, the time limits for appealing to the tribunal. It is, I can't stress how important it is to make sure you file the appeals within time because if you miss that deadline, say you've got a very good case, but you've missed the 30 day deadlines, then you've got, first you have to go through the process of making sure that uh, you need permission to uh, uh, get your late appeal accepted. And that's just adding an extra, bur extra burden for no reason. We've seen uh, cases where, reasonably good cases, but they've missed, missed the deadline to uh, appeal and by to some considerable margin as well yes 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 not just 30 days 60 days a year and then it's 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 not 
you you can't reasonably justify why you just ignored something for quite some time, which is how it might be looked at. Uh, so just on this, it's very, very important to always stick to the deadline, especially in uh, appealing to the tribunal. Dave, I think you're on mute. No, no I'm so sorry. I thought Phil was going to. Yeah, I, I, I think it's important to realise that the decision in a tax investigation is the end of the matter. Obviously, it becomes uh, something that will be looked at by a completely independent body, ultimately, if you go to tribunal. Just to reiterate the time limits that Imad has just mentioned, um, and that in dispute resolution, it is the opportunity for the taxpayer to put their side of the argument to somebody that doesn't work for HMRC and is paid to make a judgment about what they are listening to. And HMRC don't win every appeal they don't win 90% of appeals. They can be proved wrong. And I think that's very important when discussing matters with clients, etc. That a tribe uh, that appealing is a part of the process. Um, if especially if you're dealing with a very, very difficult officer. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip and Imad. Um, we will cover a number of questions that are coming through. Um, here's our contact details, should you need to contact us, and you will get um, copies of, of, of these slides for, for those who've, who've registered to join us this afternoon. So we'll have these in the, the comfort of your own, um, your own homes. And we'll now go to uh, a q and I will try and come out of my screen. We just stop screen share. Yes. Pray. Good. Let's have a look at the questions that are coming in. So, yes, somebody's asked us if they can get a copy of this uh, webinar um, when it finishes, and yes, uh, you can. We will. We will send. Uh, we will send that out. I've, I've had a, a question around the, the, the time limits for appeals because of COVID. Um, what the, uh, what the, 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 the revenue uh, announced was that if, if an appeal is dated after um, February the 20th, I, I think the, 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 the date is, um, let's just, just check. Yes, yeah, so if, 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 if an assessment has been issued after February 2020, then you have an extra three months to make that uh, appeal notice. So the th normal 30 day deadline is extended by three months because of COVID. Obviously you, you have to still argue that COVID was the reason for the delay. The, with any delays against uh, appeals, you, you have a, a reasonable excuse of why that delay occurred and you, you then have to make sure that appeal is made as soon as that reasonable excuse has ended. But there is this extra three months because of COVID. So if you have any assessments, any decisions, any determinations that have been issued after February and you've not yet appealed, um, get those appeals in now. Um, and certainly if it's within the 90 days, uh, extra three months, then you, you're not going to be going to be late to get that in again if you need assistance or help or advice on that please please do do come to us can i just add to that that in terms of proving that covid is the reason it should be quite straightforward if you if the um taxpayer who's appealing is running a business that has been shut by statute so if you were a, a hairdresser or a um a gin or anything like that you're only just getting back to um 
at, back to trading now and gyms are still waiting i believe so it should be quite easy to show that well who's going to commit to a um an appeal if they don't know they're going to have a business when the lockdown is lifted uh so these are the sort of things that we would be making uh or, or the sort of cases we would be making if with the late appeals just one point i will add uh yes COVID can be, ha, ha, we have seen cases where there have been delays because of COVID. One thing one thing uh, that can support your application is if, if you show that as soon as you were able to, uh, as soon as your circumstances change, you have tried to do everything you can to make the appeal. So again, the same thing. First of all, try and avoid missing the deadline if you can at all. Uh, if you have, then we try and uh, get uh, get the bills in as soon as it's practical. Yes, that's a very, very good point. Um, so some questions are coming in thick and fast now. We'll try and get through as many as we possibly can do. One of the questions is, um, why why bother asking for an internal review if, if they usually go against um, the, the, the taxpayer? You know, what, what is the point of asking for an internal <laughs> review? It's a very good question. Well, it is a very good question. and. Uh, don't forget, you've got no choice with a direct tax um, review. You have to seek out a view of the matter from HMRC. And once you have that, then you can appeal. So if the review of the matter is uh, uh, adverse, then you appeal. For a VAT, I tend to agree there is very little uh, point unless you want to buy time. Uh, and that's a reasonable tactic. You want to delay things because you're seeking to um, borrow money or anything like that. A review does take you apply within the 30 days and the review can take some time. And it, it just it didn't make might delay the inevitable. There's not much point to it, but that would be the only reason as far as I could see. Yes, there could be a commercial reason as, as, as well. Um, but um, but but certainly, I, th I think the, the the main reason, even if many do go against the taxpayer, you know, one um, either it's, it's as Phil's mentioned, it's it's a requirement as as a part of the process. Um, although you can go straight to the tribunal if you want to. Uh, again, my experience with tribunals is if the judge is asking, or you know, the review in the papers and finding out, well. You know what? What? How did you object to this? If if you've not objected or asked for the review, the judge is going to say, "Well, you know, why have you come straight to us? Why didn't you ask for for the review?" So that can go against you. On the other hand, uh, which has to be considered as well, if you ask for a review and it agrees with the caseworker, you've then got two um, opinions to overturn at the tribunal. So it can be it can backfire on you asking for a review as well. Um, so then you've got, it's, it's two against one by the time it gets to the tribunal, but that shouldn't um, that shouldn't hold up uh, applying for an ten review. They are of more use if you can give a new argument or some new information, or if the original caseworker has ignored a point or missed a point and is just been quite truculent about it and refuses. A new fresh pair of eyes within HMRC, although maybe still siding with the revenue should then take that new information into account i have seen internal reviews overturn the original caseworker they are not as frequent but yes it still needs to to, to be still worthwhile going through that that point um yes okay. sorry go on Emma. Sorry, I don't, I don't you, you, you've uh, you're spot on with that one one way i would look at it is yes if you are just uh, putting and uh, asking for an independent review without, uh, let's say, adding more to it, giving them something new, or just, you know, highlighting it to the independent reviewer that this is the aspect, expanding on what, if, if, if it's the same argument, but you're expanding on it and shed, uh, providing more light, more information on it, that's, uh, that's one thing. If you're pr putting a new argument in, then uh, in you will have more reason for the uh, independent review but uh, like uh, like david said you have to you have to weigh the odds and you uh, 
and it, what, what if they agree uh, with with the original decision? Then you've got uh, two opinions to overturn. Yes, yes, and indeed. Um, just sticking to another, just sticking to the negative questions at the moment, and then we'll get to some positive questions. What happens if ADR fails, um, Imad? Oh yes, so that's a, that's a very good question. So number of cases that we've had uh, that we have picked up was uh, where uh, the client has already tried ADR with uh, with with another agent, and then they have come to us. We we have reapplied for ADR. Now uh, it's not the same as applying for an ADR for the very first time. Because for the very first time, if you're applying it for the first time, you are entering into this new uh, facilitated uh, dispute resolution. Uh, but when you're applying for the second time, you have to show the ADR team and you have to really make a case that there is good reason for them to uh, allocate resource and time in uh, uh, providing another mediated uh, ADR. Uh, but we, 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 we've had a number of these. If you if you are able to make a very good case and it has to be very uh, it has to be quite good, then they will grant you another ADR. Okay, good. And I'm just working through some of the ADR questions. Let's let's keep on keep on that subject for now, if that's if that's okay. Imad, yeah. there are some tribunal questions as well, so I'll ask fill those if we have the time. If anyone's got any other questions, you can just type them in the box and send them to us, and we'll we'll get through as many as we can do. Um, how, how does ADR work in practice then, Imad? Someone's asked. It, so, so the way ADR would work in in practice is we, we've talked about the the procedure. So uh, essentially, you will you will prepare a statement of case. Uh, you will highlight what your case is. What are the areas that you need to look at? Then there is. I'm going to focus more on the ADR without lockdown. So this is a, this is a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, so it, you you come in uh, to to a meeting room. You've got the, you've got HMRC on one side. You've got the taxpayer and their agent on the other side, and uh, the mediator would essentially just. Uh, make a start he will he will control the meeting he will uh, he will try and explore the areas that we have mentioned and just uh, quiz both sides to see if they can uh, if they can reach an agreement if they are able to see things from a different perspective uh, can, they, can you ask they, the inspector questions sorry can you ask the inspector questions during ADR? Of course you can. Yeah, you can ask them questions. You can. Someone's asking uh, the question, so it's a genuine, you know, a genuine question to ask. It's not. It's not. I don't think it's a daft question to, to ask. Uh, someone. Someone has asked. Can you actually ask the? If you've not been through the process, people don't know, do they? Can Can no, you actually oh, ask? Oh, that's my bad. Question. Yes, can. Sometimes they don't like it. <laughs> they, they, Especially no, if it's they, a difficult question. Yeah, they genuinely don't. If. Um, you, you, if you do ask a difficult question about something they've done and they they might not like it but as part of the uh process uh the facilitator it's his job to ensure that they answer it honestly yeah so it, it and that's essentially uh this uh, the spirit of it the, where you are let's say if it's a difficult question that's where the facilitator will step in so you can have breakaway places where if you want to discuss something in private with your client where it's mass you want to discuss a position so they the facilitator will uh provide that opportunity so one party leaves the room and the other one stays there and they discuss those points and if if there is something that you, you do, you're not comfortable in asking, then that's where the facilitator will be there. But it's, it's overall, it, it, it's, a, it's a very sort of, uh, the objective behind that is to have a cooperative environment where you are, both parties are willing to reach a resolution. Or, but what, what I, sorry, what I would say to that and the difficult questions is if you've reached a stage where a difficult question during an ADR has led HMRC to leave the, the room and go to a breakout room to start discussing matters, then you might be looking at a successful ADR. 
Yes, in, 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 indeed. I mean, it's not meant to be adversarial like the, the, the tribunal. It is meant to be cooperative, as Imad has said. So um, actually, someone's, someone's asked a, a very sort of similar question there to, to what Phil's mentioned. What does, what does success at, at ADR actually look like? Success at ADR looks like an outcome where the client is very happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, very happy. Uh, a clients, a clients, uh, ever happy or? Uh, <laughs> well, what is, you can't really define happiness, can you? But presumably, you know, if you're going in with some some expectations and you've had a case that's been rumbling on for a long time, and you don't think it's going anywhere, then then success has to be any improvement from where it was previously. Oh, uh, and the ideal scenario is to, oh, to get everything you want. Well, I know that Jamal and Imad had um, a very successful uh, uh, ADR where um, I think it was during lockdown, HMRC took the decision to withdraw all the decisions. It was a tremendous result. And that was as a result of the, the, um, the case that was put during the ADR. And uh, it was a fabulous result for the client. And similarly, I know that um, Imad uh, had to travel up to Scotland. Um, this was, I think, in February. Um, and despite the, the uh, difficulties of his hotel, was able to uh, get, a, a, again, a tremendous result for his client. So, in that situation, that was a much reduced assessment, if I'm not wrong. Yes, yes, a largely reduced assessment. I mean, it comes to a point where the, it's it's about what the clients are expecting. Uh, a lot of these cases, uh, there will be some sort of uh, a liability, but uh, it's not. It's the quantum of it, and the quantum is reduced significantly to the point that it reflects the position which is uh, as, as true as possible. And don't forget the penalty position as well. You're also looking during an ADR um, to try and get penalties either withdrawn or suspended if possible. Yeah. Um, and that's another outcome you're always looking for. We, we love we love penalties. We love bringing them down. <laughs> well, that's a good, could you pick up on that? Because I, I don't think you can see the questions. I think I, only I can see the questions coming in because uh, I'm, 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 I'm the mediator for this this webinar today. <laughs> uh, yeah, somebody da did ask what about penalties. So thank you for, for covering that one in, in advance. Maybe if we can turn now to some questions about the, the, the tribunal. And one, one person's asking, um, what what, does, what what actually happens on the day? How does the tribunal actually work on, on the day, um, Phil? Well, you'll go in. Um, it normally starts that if um, if it's just a straightforward contesting of uh, a, a, an assessment, then it's your appeal to make. So you, the taxpayer, go first. Whoever's representing you will speak, will talk to the judge about the, the important points in the skeleton argument that will have been served on the uh, court. And then after that, um, the taxpayer will give evidence. However, in matters where fraud is asserted, HMRC are required to go first. And um, the onus is on HMRC to prove their case where they allege that transactions may have been connected to fraud. And in that situation, they will usually have uh, counsel. Counsel will present the case and then they will start um, with uh, their witnesses giving evidence. And it, it should be remembered that um, when HMRC officers give evidence, they are you are entitled to have your representative or yourself, if you're representing yourself at a tribunal, you are able to ask questions of the officers. You can cross-examine them on their witness evidence and you can look to, if you think their evidence has been uh, deliberately short or has missed something which is really important, you would be seeking to draw that out. Um, although you would go in a witness box, it's not an adversarial as, say, a crown court or a magistrate's court. The best way to describe um, a tribunal, especially on matters of tax law or VAT law, is that it's like a conversation with rules. 
Um, and as long as you follow the rules, it remains uh, very, um, uh, very genteel. Um, and nobody should be losing their temper and nobody should be pointing fingers at anybody. That can happen in really contended, contested cases, such as fraud cases. Um, and it's something that the judges, by and large, do not like. They like the arguments to be made in a quiet, dignified manner because they take notes most of the time. Sometimes you have trans, uh, transcribers, but if they're taking notes, they want to be able to follow. And if a shouting match starts, then that becomes much harder to do. So by and large, it is, as I say, a conversation with rules um, and it's carried out uh, very calmly. And though witnesses will be cross-examined uh, and um, uh, either side can can obviously in, in effect cross-examine the other side's arguments as, as well and I have been in tribunals where they that sometimes can get um, heated but it's not it's not like a court that you see on telly where people stand up and shouting objection my lord um, that that doesn't quite quite happen in the tribunal. Sometimes HMRC do instruct uh, counsel that will uh, try and grandstand um, and to be fair the judges are fairly um, are very experienced and they're fairly well alive to when counsel is grandstanding and it more than most cases it goes against HMRC so it, 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 you especially find it with the more theatrical barrister especially the QC's Yes, yes, indeed. Which which sort of leads us up to another question: is is how, how do the judges actually reach their um, decision? Well, first of all, they will start and look at the law, and they will look at the legal aspects that HMRC have used to reach their decision. And if they think HMRC have not met the legal test that's required, then the taxpayer has won. If HMRC have met the legal test, then they sit back and they look at the facts and they apply those facts to the legal test, to the law, to the legislation. Um, and then once they've done that, they will then reach their decision. So, again, whilst an officer may be very contentious, may be very obstinate and may actually, they're, 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 I'm sure there are so many rude words you could use to describe that kind of officer. The fact is, sometimes those kind of officers lose sight of what they're actually trying to do. And in that situation, their decisions are vulnerable and tribunal judges are uh, equipped to deal with that sort of problem. Yes. And I mean, if, if the if the decision, well, obviously it's, it's to either party, uh, either party can can uh, appeal that decision to the upper tribunal as well. If the, if the taxpayer loses, they can uh, appeal to the upper tribunal. Uh, and if you lose at the upper tribunal, you can appeal to the Court of Appeal. And then if you don't like that, you can appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, but often you might have to get leave uh, of permission. The, the each lower court where the decision was made does have to grant um, uh, the right to appeal to the next stage. If that is refused, you have to then make the appeal direct to the higher court for the higher court to decide whether to allow the appeal or not. And as, as, as Phil mentioned earlier on, um, generally, if you go into the upper courts, you can only appeal on points of law. It's, it's absolutely crucial. And I know from my experience with cases at tax tribunal that the, all the facts possible are brought into play at the first tier. You can't bring in new evidence or new facts at the higher tribunals, at the higher courts. In exceptional circumstances, the judge may uh, grant new facts, new information. Um, it would have to be extreme and something that was never known previously. Um, but even sending in late information, um, because you should comply with directions during the various stages of sharing information with the revenue uh, and the revenue sharing information with the appellants. If, if you bring in a new argument or new documents right at the, the end before the tribunal hearing itself, that can be refused. 
the, the tribunal judge might say, no, you had all the time previously. We're not accepting that new evidence. We're not accepting that new argument. We will ignore it uh, completely. So it's, it's very, very important that the preparation um, is, is detailed. All the facts are there. Everything that needs to be in the witness statement is, is relevant and also included. Just got time maybe for, for another, another very, very brief question. Um, unless, unless anybody else has, uh, unless either really want to, want anything to, to sum up. Um, but one, one other question we've, we've got to quick, quickly answer is about costs. Someone's asked what happens with, 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 with costs. And, um, if, if you lose your case, who, who pays the costs? If, um, HMR, if you lose at tribunal and the case has not been classed as a complex case, then you have no exposure to HMRC's costs. But on the flip side of that, if you win, HMRC don't pay legal costs of um, the appellants. Unless HMRC have behaved very badly through the litigation. If they've submitted uh, witness statements late, if they've um, been caught out in being economical with the truth, and it has happened in the past, um, that sort of thing, then you could make a case that their behaviour has caused your costs to be much higher than they would necessarily be. And in that situation, you could try and recover your, uh, you could make a case to the tribunal to have a costs order made against them. If a case is highlighted as complex, that would normally be um, on a very high level legal and uh, technical question. And in that situation, uh, if, it was com if it was granted as a complex status, then both sides would bear um, uh, the a liability for the other side's costs in the in the uh if uh, a win or a loss happens that's very rare and most the huge majority of cases do not bear uh, any costs if, if it is um decided to be a complex case as well then the appellant can opt out of costs uh, so therefore you you're not going to pay the revenues cost if you did lose a complex case absolutely as, yeah, thank you. as phil mentioned though obviously if you win the complex case you can't claim costs either uh, and as, as phil's also mentioned it can go the other way so if you've made a vexatious appeal um, and wasted the revenues time then there you are at risk that the revenue can pursue you for cost as well it does work both ways either way it's going to be down to the tribunal and judge to decide on on costs if it goes to the upper tribunal however you are totally on a cost basis the loser pays the winner's costs once it gets to the upper tribunal and at higher courts Again, the, 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 the judge, the tribunal will award costs and you're not going to get 100% equally. You're not going to be liable to 100%. Generally, it might be in the, in the range of anything between 30 and 70% of costs. Depends on, on, on the basis of, of those costs, how they've been calculated, um, etc. But certainly if you appeal a first tier tribunal case to the upper tribunal, you are at risk of costs if you lose. But equally, you can claim costs back if you win. I think I think that's covered uh, most of today. Was there something else you wanted to add there, uh, Phil? No, no, I'm fine. Just thank you. Did you want to add, add anything else? You're on mute, um, Imad. Oh, sorry. No, can, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, there you now, yeah. Sure. Just very, very, uh, very oh. briefly on the point about costs uh, and uh, the the previous point that we were talking about in going to appeal, escalating the appeal on the uh, in the tribunal from first year to upper tier and then further on. Uh, a very crucial point is to make sure when you're doing that, you you really assess the case and uh, look at some. Uh, there's there should be some point of law uh, there are a lot of clients that we've had and and Phil Phil will know this a lot more uh, they always 
seem to think that just because a fact hasn't been considered, we can just take it to up a tribunal. And, and, and <laughs> it can be costly. I was going to say, the only way you can appeal facts is if it is a material um, misunderstanding that mm. has led to the wrong legal decision being taken. I, I mean, on, on the... Say, if you've got... Uh, a, a point of law that you are you are using to go to the upper tribunal and then at upper tribunal stage once the case is being heard perhaps at that point you can we bring in facts on, or there can be no new evidence entered it is purely a legal argument before the tribunal the upper tribunal mm. yeah purely that Okay. okay, thank you. Very well. There's some very, very useful points that have come out of, of today. So we can answer every single question. If you do have any further questions, please do get in touch and we will try and answer those. If you need help and advice with any appeals and, and decisions against HMRC, then again, please, please do get in, in touch and we'll, we'll help you and assist through the process and, and give a view on, on your case as well. Otherwise, please look out for uh, in the next emails. We will be doing a, another tax investigations webinar next month. Also in two weeks time, please look out for our next tax ad advice webinar as well. Uh, we, we, do, we alternate uh, tax advice and tax investigations webinars on a monthly basis. Thank you very much for joining us and we will send out copies to those who've registered. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.